Uh, thank you very much, Eileen, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the final speaker um, for our morning session, the theatre and opera designer, Alex Eels. Um, it's fitting that we welcome Alex here today, um, because Alan, uh, Alex, of course, uh, trained at the Wimbledon School of Art. Um, and since his days at Wimbledon, his career has really flourished across many international platforms and many prestigious international theatres. Some of you may know Alex's work best um, from his recent productions in London, including Cleansed at the National Theatre, just across the way, in the Dorfman, I think. Um, also, Maladie de la Moore at the Barbican, and also recently, uh, Anatomy of a Suicide and Not I Footfalls and Rockabye at the Royal Court. Um, it's actually Anatomy of a Suicide that I'd like to just make a brief reference to. Um, inevitably, in planning today's symposium, I've been constantly thinking about what the real is, what truth is, what's not real, what is illusion. And I was thinking back to a time when I was in the theatre and I was sort of swept away by the illusion of theatre. And I think it was actually an anatomy of a suicide when I was fully swept away. Um, for those of you who don't know the performance, uh, there's a moment when a, a suicide is actually staged on stage. And this, the production on that particular moment was absolutely shattering for me personally. And I sort of had to remind myself that what I was watching was an illusion. And that's, that in itself is a testament to the calibre of Alex's work as a designer and the calibre of that production. So without further ado, I will introduce Alex um, and his talk now. Um, thanks, Matt. Uh, very kind words. Um, um, I'm going to talk today about um, some, uh, I've called it considerations for designing realism. These are some things and some uh, ideas that I use when uh, working as a designer. And I'm going to be um, uh, talking about shows that I've worked on which would be described as having a realistic design. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be talking about anatomy of a suicide at all. Um, uh, they're not, as I say, they're kind of considerations. They're not really hard rules, and they can be adhered to or disregarded, and they appear in my work to a greater or lesser degree. Um, and I'll be relating these considerations to four productions I've designed within the last few years. So the first is Cleansed by Sarah Kane that was here at the National. Uh, Matt talked about that in the Dorfman just over there. Um, a version of Happy Days by Samuel Beckett that I did in uh, the Marlesaal at uh, the Deutsche Schauspielhaus in Hamburg. Um, I'll also be talking about a production, uh, two Martin Crimp plays. So the first is The Rest Will Be Familiar to You from Cinema, um, which is a production uh, which is a version of Euripides' Phoenician Women. And then the last production is... Uh, a play called Sleeping Men, or its German title is Schlafende Männer. Um, so some of these ideas cross over into each other, but I'm going to try and split them into four sections, really. So section one is about the physical relationship between the stage and the audience. Uh, section two is about the world of the play. Um, section three covers how I choose objects and how I consider physical objects in the environment. And lastly, section four covers ideas about the significant, or rather not uh, significant, how individual items and the entire design can be. Um, I get, before I start, I'm just going to kind of like, I get asked, I get asked quite a lot, why, why design something realistically? Why not design it symbolically or abstract? Um, and I think one of the ways that, I should have mentioned that all four of these plays were directed by Katie Mitchell, and she's a long-term collaborator with me. And um, one of the reasons we tend to design these plays to be quite realistic is we're looking for 
an emotional response which is based in reality, which is based in how we understand reality and how we relate to the world around us. So what we're trying to do is create a world that is recognisable in a way, and therefore what happens within that world becomes emotionally uh, and psychologically um, more uh, affecting in some ways. So uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, about kind of sealing the world. So how to seal the world of the stage from the world of the audience. And this is something that I do um, quite a lot. And uh, it's interesting sometimes um, this term of the fourth wall and how we see through the fourth wall because uh, a lot of the times we literally... Uh, me and Katie, we will design a room and we will cut the wall off it. So we are looking directly through a wall. So there's a number of things to say about Firstly, that line that we cut is kind of a very straight, clean line from top to bottom. There is generally no bleeding into the auditorium or uh, there is... We try not to do things on thrust stages or have elements of the design that come into the auditorium or break that line. That line is really clean. It's kind of like straight down. Um, because it's kind of the fourth wall that we're kind of removing, uh, a lot of the times we design very square-looking sets. So you're looking into... This is cleansed. And you're looking into it dead straight... Um, so that you're not looking at it at an odd angle, you're not looking at it from um, anything other than as if we've taken that wall away. Um, and then to go back to uh, uh, one of Arnold's points about ceilings, uh, so maybe this is very old kind of like Russian kind of influence, we almost always put a ceiling on the space. So this helps to... Um, this helps to contain this world. Um, and the last thing that kind of we tend to do is also um, be really... Uh, to, or to at least to think quite hard about what you might be able to see through the window, for example. Um, if there is a video projected backdrop of a realistic scene or if there is a sky with clouds moving up across it, or whether you can't actually see through the windows. Cleansed, for example, there was ivy and kind of dirt all over the windows. And although there was a sense that there was something out there, there was uh, quite a strong um, consideration we made to make sure that you couldn't see an outside world, so that everything kind of is reflected into the space inside. Um, the second thing that we do, which I hope is going to be a bit clearer in this uh, slide. Uh, so this is Happy Days by Samuel Beckett. Now normally this, uh, or at least in the text, um, this play is staged with a woman, Winnie, uh, buried up to her waist in earth, in kind of a exterior space. But to try, there were two reasons why we wanted to kind of like change this. Firstly, we wanted to talk about um, an environmental impact, which is why she's trapped up to her waist in water. So this is real water. We flooded the stage for this production. Um, And secondly, we wanted to kind of domesticate this, uh, the... um, the, the reasons and the kind of the outcome of why uh, she is trapped in this position. And we wanted to kind of make these things kind of relatable. So rather than her being in an abstract environment, we wanted to kind of make this feel like it was something that the audience could understand. If your home was flooded, if you were somehow trapped because your leg had been caught under the water because the floor had subsided, for example... This is something that the audience could really understand rather than a slightly more abstracted version of this. Um, but what you can see just about... I might use the 
laser pointer here. There's, so you can see there's a dark line across here. And again, at the top, there's a dark line here. So what we've done, this is a studio space, but we generally frame the, uh, the set. And um, I tend to do this with a big black surge frame. And one of the things that this helps to do is to stop the audience looking at the rest of the theatre environment. We want them to be able to look directly into the set and to be um, immersed almost in what is happening. So one of the reasons is, is to obliterate all sense of theatre lighting, mm -hmm. speakers, um, any bits of the rest of the stage, uh, any proscenium covered up, all of the technical aspects completely obliterated so that the only uh, view of what's happening is through this window. And that's again clear on this um, piece here, which is a, uh, this is Sleeping Men, where again we had, I cropped it out of the photo, but you, there is this clean frame around this, which means that you can't see theatre lights and you can't see any of that other uh, technology. The other thing which uh, we've done in a number of these plays is that we've introduced a, 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 f a black um, curtain that either comes in from above um, or comes in from the side. Um, and what this allows us to do, again, to kind of like add to the sense that we're looking into a real world, is the action is already happening when the curtain opens. So the curtain opens and something is already taking part. We don't open the curtains, lights change, and then action starts. As that curtain opens, normally quite fast, the lights are already on, people are already doing something. It's as if we have just switched the television on and we are in that moment. Um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is about... Uh, kind of setting the rules. So when I'm considering kind of a realistic design, it doesn't necessarily have to be boring or it doesn't have to necessarily kind of uh, exist just in a kind of a man mundane environment. Um, but it does need to be based on the familiar, or at least it does for our, our work. Um, most of us get the information about the world around us by seeing... So we can recognise a school or a church by the type of architecture it is and the shapes, colours and materials that we see. Um, so when designing some of these shows, although they might be set in uh, a dream world or a slightly odd um, world where strange things happen, um, we tend to put it in an environment that is recognisable. So this um, is the rest will be familiar to you from cinema, um, but it's set in an old abandoned house, but the everything about it kind of like has a recognised has a recognisable quality to it. But this brings me on to uh, another thing which we're kind of interested in, which is about it's about architecture actually, and it's about making sense of this architectural space. Um, and you can apply certain rules to the space that you can to character. And you reuse the same kind of techniques that actors will use. Um, and some of you will know that Katie works quite a lot with Stanislavskian techniques. Uh, and you can apply that to the set. So what's the backstory of the architecture? What is this building? When was it built? Um, what purpose did it have? Um, but also, what is it now? Is it used for the same purposes? Is it the same? In this, uh, this was built as a country house, but then it was used as a school. So there are elements of kind of um, timetables and kind of like school uh, posters um, pinned to the walls. You can't quite see it, but there were kind of um, through this, the doorway over here, there were. Um, racks for school uh, for coats and hats um, 
And also, uh, you can see above the doors, there are exit signs. So this was used, this was a building that was once, like I say, a country house, but has now been kind of slightly institutionalised. Um, but also, even though you can design something realistically, it doesn't necessarily have to conform to real rules. In this production, uh, every now and again, we rewound what was happening. So um, we, could, uh, we would run through a scene and then we would rewind it really quickly um, so that we could uh, have a look again at a certain moment of that. Um, but that rule, taken out of context of this production, might seem kind of unrealistic. But if you're, uh, if you're considerate and it's kind of like it all works within the rules that you've set yourself for the production. There's no reason why uh, that can't happen. Um, again, in Cleansed... Oh, this is... Uh, um, oh, I've lost my place in the slides. Um, Yeah, in Cleansed, um, the history of the building, again, was something that we were kind of uh, interested in. Um, this was a building designed in the 1930s, built as a public building, and then obviously reappropriated at some point into a hospital, and then kind of like used, or we'd imagined that it had been used um, as some kind of mental institution but then again abandoned and left for nature to kind of encroach um, on the space. But that idea that nature had encroached on the space allowed us to kind of do things within the space that might not necessarily happen in, uh, in reality in terms of a kind of time scale. So, for example, there's a sunflower that you can just see on the right, and that appears in the script that a sunflower bursts through the floor and grows. Um, but within the context, our use of the playing of time works as a reality because this, uh, we designed this play to feel like it was Grace, the character in the middle, that it was her dream, that everything was happening within it um, is slightly... Um, uh, as if she is dreaming through these series of scenes. Um, that also allowed us to be able to put the whole play into one environment. So that although there are separate scenes in the play, ranging from um, the gymnasium to outside the uh, building, we were able to kind of re-transition uh, all of these scenes into this one kind of um, one space that allows us to maintain that reality and to uh, constantly kind of like pressurize the situation into coming, uh, in this case, more and more nightmarish. Um, this is. Um, so. I'm going to talk about some uh, kind of like how we or how I start considering what certain objects and props are going to be and how certain things within the design um, have to work. Um, designing for realism requires a certain rigour. Objects like props or doors, lights or speakers have real world qualities. Um, it's quite interesting for Happy Days because... Uh, as you might know, she has a gun in her uh, handbag. Um, it's never, or at least it's never implied that this is used in the play. But um, a real gun is both heavy and dense. It's difficult to hold for the first time anyway. Um, it's tricky to place on a table gently because of its weight and its function. Um, and these are all things that have to be kind of considered when choosing props or when kind of like designing for something like this. Um, not only for the audience, but also for the actor. The actor's uh, 
ability to work with an object affects the way that they perform. And an audience is very um, is able to perceive this um, very uh, very precisely. Um, I think it was Malcolm Gladwell in his book Blink talks about thin slicing, which is this concept where experts are able to make quite fast distinctions about what is, for example, kind of like a um, a genuine painting by a certain artist or if it's a fake mainly because they've spent so much time with that work that they are able to perceive something about that quality and I think that we are all experts in real life we can spot fakes quite easily we can spot if a if a gun isn't quite as heavy as it should be or if a suitcase that an actor brings on stage doesn't have two weeks worth of clothes in it and that's something that you suddenly have to become really aware of when designing uh, some of these pieces. Um, again, when talking about actors in terms of uh, objects, um, sometimes it's really useful to give them, if they have a diary, for example, that it's a real diary, that it's kind of got entries in it that they possibly you give to the actor to allow them to put in uh, like a fictional backstory of that character. But then that object has a real kind of tangible quality and both the performance of the actor and how that is read by an audience kind of increases somewhat. Um, I'm going to now talk about the, what... And this is quite specific in some of the realistic work that I do which is about what I would call a myth, the myth of the significant object. So in modern films, we, keep, we see quite a lot of significant objects. For example, in The Sixth Sense, there are the colour red um, on the door handle, for example, is what, would, what I would term as a significant object. But I think there are two things uh, to remember about your audience when considering something like a design like this. And the first thing is that they, um, they'll always spot the thing that you don't want them to look at. So the fake thing, they will always kind of pick up on. And the second thing is that they will never spot the thing that you have, been, that you have preciously put in there as little joke or homage or some kind of meaningful gesture. So, for example, in, I'm going to use myself as an example here. Um, Sarah Kane went to uh, Bristol University. So the signage on the wall in Cleansed is based on the university signage at Bristol. But of course, this is something that absolutely no one is going to spot and no one's got any clue about um, whatsoever. Um, I'm hoping this next slide is the one that I'm expecting. Uh, it's not. I'm going to go back a little bit. Yeah, so it's the same in Happy Days. There was, um, it's entirely dark and you can't see at all, but on the back wall there's a shopping list. And this is something that I drew up for uh, the character Winnie. And it's a list of things that she may have, uh, may have been planning to buy before the kind of unknown incident that caused this flooding um, happened. And uh, at that point, uh, I mean, at that that's something that is kind of, it's quite, it's quite interesting for a designer to kind of like have these ideas to come up with this stuff. But it's something that it might not be, uh, it might not be something that the um, audience is going to pick up from. Um, however, this leads me on to uh, something that I think is, is vitally important about this type of, um, work and I'm going to probably just skim back again and try and find yeah this is pretty good um, I believe quite strongly in the an idea about um, cumulative visual information um, in, re in our everyday life we are bombarded with visual information there is absolutely too much to take in in your walk from the train station or wherever to here 
it's not possible to remember every single object, every single uh, sign that you saw. There is too much of it, so you filter it all out. Um, and the way that I sometimes approach the realis realistic designs is to take that principle, is to slightly overwhelm and bombard the audience with too much information. However, um, a lot of that information you can use and only cumulatively is it possible to kind of read it. So, for example, in Cleanse, there are an awful lot of things in the design that are all considered individually that might not be obvious individually, but as a group, cumulatively come together to kind of give you a sense. Um, so there are a lot of things in Cleanse that are designed specifically to unsettle the audience. So the first is that this is some kind of institutional building. There are bars on the window. There, uh, there is medical furniture. There are fire extinguishers on the wall. There are gates. There are padlocks. There's the use of restraints. And not all of this stuff is uh, uh, specific to the script. But some of it is just in the design to help um, ground this idea that, uh, that there is something kind of awful about to happen, and does happen in Cleansed. If anyone knows it, that you'll know that at certain points, um, terrible things happen to people. There is a moment when someone has their tongue cut out, which is one rather gruesome extreme. Um, but another where the character Robin, here in the red dress, is forced to eat um, 24 chocolates out of a box. Um, and I think the audience response to this was um, quite extreme sometimes. A lot of people found that this was by far the worst part of the play. And considering this play has hands being cut off, tongues being cut out, and all the rest of it. Um, the idea that it's actually just force-feeding was by far the worst bit. But this is because this actor um, did eat 24 chocolates uh, every day. Now, we, we had slightly kind of improved the situation. These were hollow, and they weren't kind of like entirely um, filled but he did literally have to eat 24 of them, one after the other in this scene that a lot of people, like I say, just found um, entirely unbearable. Um, but I'm, I think I'm just going to... Yeah, I'm just going to leave you with this image um, of Cleansed and just um, kind of reiterate some of the points that I made, that it's uh, the way that we kind of create these worlds is, li is mainly about sealing that environment and that separation between what's happening on stage and what's happening in, uh, and the audience that allows the audience to really believe and to, uh, to experience what's happening on stage. Um, as realistically as possible. Um, thanks very much.